One of the most famous and iconic Zen masters in Japanese history is certainly Ikkyu Sojun, who was born in 1394 as an illegitimate child of the emperor Go Komatsu with one of his favorite concubines. Driven by jealousy, the empress evicted Ikkyu's mother from the court, and fearing for his safety, Ikkyu's mother sent the child to be raised at the Zen temple on Kokuji at Kyoto at the age of five. Many humorous anecdotes are told in Japan of Ikkyu's precocious and naughty exploits as a child within the monastery, which often act as parables, exposing the sometime hypocrisy within the monastic establishment. On one occasion, Ikkyu was assigned to clean the abbot's chambers, where there was a precious bowl filled with the abbot's favorite sweets. Noticing Ikkyu's interest in the sweets, the abbot told him these sweets, while beneficial for adults, were deadly poison if eaten by children. Ikkyu was not fooled for a moment, and after the abbot left the room, Ikkyu took the sweets, ate some of them, and shared the rest with his fellows. He then broke the bowl which had contained the sweets. Upon returning to his chambers, the abbot was furious to find his treasured bowl broken and the sweets gone. Angrily, he asked Ikkyu what had happened, to which Ikkyu responded, Master, while cleaning your room, I accidentally broke your bowl. Feeling great sorrow for my mistake, I decided to take my own life by eating the poisoned sweets, but alas, I did not perish. A naturally brilliant and artistically talented child, Ikkyu excelled at his studies, and at the age of 15 left Kyoto for a remote monastery in the hills to study with the Daitokuji-trained master Kino. After five years of study with Kino, the master passed away, and at age 20, Ikkyo once again returned to Kyoto, where he was to meet his principal teacher, the master Kazo, who had also been trained at Daitokuji. At first, Kazo was reluctant to accept Ikkyo as a disciple, and made him undergo various austerities before being admitted to the monastery. However, Ikkyu's single-minded determination to follow the path of Zen touched the master's heart, and he was admitted, gradually becoming one of the master's closest disciples. It was around this time that Ikkyu's particular personality as a Zen master began to emerge. It is said that Ikkyu naturally distrusted authority, and he became increasingly critical of the Zen institution of the Gozan, in which spiritual materialism was gradually taking the place of hardcore Zen training and values. I suppose inevitably, almost inevitably, uh, when an institution flourishes as the Gozan was flourishing, uh, problems uh, emerge. And uh, certainly by the uh, 15th century, uh, some of the monks within the, the Gozan uh, monasteries uh, were beginning uh, to uh, complain or to feel that uh, institutionalization uh, and bureaucratization and maybe wealth and uh, acceptance of uh, sta status in society, that all of these were taking away from the intensity, directness of uh, Zen practice and training in these monasteries. Uh, the monk Ikkyu uh, is perhaps the most notable critic within uh, Rinzai circles, uh, saying that uh, monks had become like uh, rice bags, uh, sitting around and enjoying a comfortable life in the monastery, and having lost the basic spirit of, of Zen practice. Ikkyu believed that the trouble with Zen becoming so successful was that people would become Zen monks just in order to be successful, in order to rise up in society and in the government instead of because they had a deep and burning uh, true feeling for Zen. Ikkyu's enlightenment experience is said to have come at dawn, when after meditating all night in a boat on a small pond, the sound of a crow's cawing suddenly deeply awakened his recognition of Buddha nature. Presenting his realization to Kazo for validation, the master passed him on his experience, and attempted to give Ikkyu the formal Inca Shome, or transmission document, authenticating the student's enlightenment experience. 
Upon his receipt of the certificate, E.Q. promptly ripped it into pieces and left the monastery to continue his post-enlightenment cultivation in the rugged mountains surrounding Kyoto, in the Kansai area of Japan. Wandering and meditating on his own for a number of years, Ikkyu's Zen practice became deeper and more grounded in the realities of the Japan of his day, outside the cloistered confines of the culturally refined monasteries of the Gozon. Seeing and tasting the realities of life among the lives of different strata of Japanese society, Ikkyu blended his meditation with the world as he found it, and tremendously deepened both his Zen understanding and his compassionate resolve to benefit others. Uh, another story they tell in Zen is of people who are learning kendo, the martial art that involves swordsmanship. If you just practice in the practice hall with a wooden sword and get very good at that, you may defeat all the other people in the, in the group practicing in that dojo, that hall, you may think you really are a great swordsman. But if you take that wooden sword out into the street and, and, and are challenged by a real samurai with a real metal sword, you don't stand a chance. And that's a metaphor for being able to actualize your insight in the real world. Uh, and that's always been an important part of Buddhism. E.Q. felt that the purity and enlightenment that were the focus of Zen were to be found not by repudiating the world, but rather by embracing it. One of E.Q.'s main insights was that there was really no artificial duality between enlightenment and the world itself. Much like the um, lotus coming out of the muddy waters, it's, it's, it's kind of like that. The lotus comes up to the top of the pond, blossoms, and from these muddy beginnings or this muddy, tainted context, a sense of purity can be attained. I think this is the appeal of EQ, even after three or four hundred years, is that he felt, much like John Milton did, the, the, the Puritan, that salvation would be available to any, anyone. In fact, uh, if you were to come out of a sullied, uh, tainted environment and then achieve your salvation, that's almost better than being an angel you know, or being a bodhisattva from beginning to end. There's been, there's been no sense of development or contrast or evolution or... To EQ, many of the honest, natural values that he found among the lay people and commoners that he spent time with were in sharp distinction to what he felt were the often hypocritical values found in some of the Gozan monasteries. He was very, very critical of the Zen establishment of his day. He thought it didn't represent true, honest uh, Zen, uh, that people were in it for the successful lifestyle that they could achieve, or the power that they could achieve, or the adulation that they could achieve. And so he was uh, kind of a uh, peck's bad boy of Zen in some ways. One of Ikkyu's poems clearly expresses his disdain for the formal Zen institution and his preference for Zen training outside the monastery. Woodcutters and fishermen have everything they need. What use have I for the carved chairs and wooden floors of Zen? With straw sandals and a bamboo staff, I roam 3,000 worlds, dwelling in water, subsisting on wind for 20 years. In 1427, Ikkyu was summoned to the palace of the retired emperor Go Komatsu, who was reportedly Ikkyu's father. And Go Komatsu took spiritual counsel and advice from Ikkyu. At the end of Gokumatsu's life a few years later, Ikkyu was again summoned to the palace and presented with some valuable scrolls and artworks which he cherished for the rest of his life. These meetings can be taken as further evidence that the emperor Gokumatsu and Ikkyu were in fact truly father and son. Ikkyu had great devotion for Master Lin Chi or Rinzai, the iconoclastic patriarch of the Chan school. E.Q. also held the master Tsu Tang, who had been Dayo Kokushi's Chan teacher, in very high esteem. Following in the footsteps of these masters, E.Q. increasingly turned to more and more irreverent and iconoclastic expressions of Zen values. 
E.Q. is said to have often quoted Su Tang, who said that the law of the Buddha consists in doing what is right and proper, not in making lavish buildings and fancy titles. E.Q. began to express his realization more and more in brilliant poetry, and he left a legacy of over 2,000 Zen poems extolling the virtues of solitude, the beauty of nature, and among other things, his love of sex and the twilight environment of the so-called floating world of brothels, drinking establishments, and other sensual pleasures. In 1440, Ikkyu was called to serve as abbot of Nyoi An, a sub-temple of Daitokuji. After only a short time, he was so disgusted with the experience that he left. The poem he wrote to commemorate the experience represents the epitome of Ikkyu's Zen view at the time and has become iconic of Ikkyu himself. Only ten fussy days as an abbot, and already my feet are tangled in red tape. If someday you want to look me up, try the fish shop, the tavern, or the brothel. <laughs> and so he's deliberately ridiculing the monks of his day. Of course, the, they're not supposed to eat meat. They're not supposed to drink, so they shouldn't show up at a fish shop or a tavern, and needless to say, they're supposed to be celibate, so they shouldn't have anything to do with a bravo. So he's, he's deliberately flaunting the rules, uh, and he apparently in his, own, in his own life did actually break those rules, but he's doing it with a purpose, I think, because he's showing that there's kind of be, there can be a false uh, sanctimoniousness, if that's a word. EQ's upfront attitudes toward sex and other taboo subjects is often revealed dramatically within the body of his powerful and immediate Zen poetry, which he often used as a vehicle to criticize what he saw as the hypocrisy prevalent in the Zen institution of the Gozan. Stilted koans and convoluted answers are all monks have, pandering endlessly to officials and rich patrons. Good friends of the Dharma, so proud. Let me tell you, a brothel girl in gold brocade is worth more than any of you. One purpose of Zen training is, you know, if you're hungry, eat. If you're tired, sleep. If you feel sexual, it's, it's part of your, your Buddha nature as well. Right. So, um, you, hypo is it me? you hypocrites? <laughs> I'm out here and I'm doing what you're doing, but doing it in the open. And I'm not afraid. And I'm... I'm uh, um, Using that, um, these things to, um, they can be also part of Zen training, being in the brothel and being in the tavern. And you're not going to kill the red thread of passion. It's not going to go away. You can pretend it's not there and you can hide it, but it's going to be, it should be out in the open. So he was saying, um, um, any, don't be hypocrites. Although E.Q. is remembered greatly for his wild antics and irrepressible individualism, he was also a great pioneer in the fields of poetry, Zen art, and calligraphy. E.Q.'s bold style of calligraphy and brushwork is a clear influence on later works of Zen art. He did, he did uh, calligraphy and painting in which he tried not at all to have beauty or successful technique or fancy style, but just seemed to be instant. Uh, spontaneous, instant sort of overflow of his character. Sometimes he'd start writing in a careful sort of standard script, and as he got along, he'd get more excited, and the calligraphy would get wilder and faster. And uh, he was just amazing. He uh, really did his own thing. E.Q. was also one of the architects of what has become known in Japan as Chado, the way of tea, sometimes known as the tea ceremony. E.Q. believed that the tea ceremony should act as a vehicle for the expression of Zen values and aesthetics. There was a change in the history of taste that occurred in Japan about this time, and I think E.Q. had something to do with it. We've seen this change in the 20th century, I think, in the Western world, but up till then, I think Japan was the first country to go through this kind of change. Art tends to develop towards more and more perfection. I mean, ceramics, for example, Chinese ceramics start out kind of rough, but they get more and more gorgeous and more and more exquisite and more and more perfect. And the same thing kind of happened in Japan up through the Heian period, the great courtly period. You had a kind of aesthetic in which the arts of Japan were incredibly refined and elegant and gorgeous and, you know, truly wonderfully beautiful. 
And then along comes EQ and a few other, and a few other Zen masters, and they say, yes, you know, a, a beautiful, colorful ceramic may be very nice, but how about that old farmer's pot in the corner, you know, which has the glaze that the ash accidentally dropped on it, which is slightly cracked. That's very beautiful too. Maybe it's even more beautiful. And the tea ceremony helped to, through Zen and the tea ceremony to spread a new kind of aesthetic in which the, uh, the rough, the ready, the natural uh, became just as beautiful as the exquisite and the refined.